welcome uh, Casey Uhlenhut. Thank you. All right, we're good. All right, howdy y'all, how you doing today? Yeah, do we have any people from Louisville in the house? Represent, go Cards, sorry, I know they're UK fans, which is like not allowed, but we'll roll with it this time. So we only got 20 minutes to speed through this, so I want you all to hold on to your seats and hats because we are going for a ride. So traditionally, Microsoft has had release cycles like a rocket trying to land on Jupiter. We spend, we spend time and years in space before we make our big landing. But the modern Microsoft is now set to navigate the agile and changing world of open source. Uh, and we want to do this well. Specifically, in order to do this well, we think we need to manage the three tensions of open product development. Uh, and these tensions are maintaining product direction, uh, reconciling salaried and passionate contributors, and adapting to distributed teams. So I'm Casey Ullenhu. I'm a program manager on the .NET team at Microsoft. And today, I'm going to first talk about how .NET set out on our open source voyage today and where we are. I'm then going to talk about our approaches to navigating the three tensions I just mentioned. And lastly, we're going to take a look uh, at how well our efforts have gone so far going open source and how we need to improve going forward. So Microsoft's open source journey actually started about 10 years ago when we open sourced Wix on SourceForge, which may be a blast to the past for some of you. Uh, since then, we have been involved in open source in several ways. Uh, you can see a couple of the projects we've worked on here. Um, the main ways that we contribute to open source, though, are uh, yeah, by contributing, to, uh, contributing code to open source, which, for example, we have a lot of the open source we've done with .NET or TypeScript. We integrate with open source projects like Docker or Cordova. And we interrupt with open source tools and platforms like GitHub or Web Frameworks. Uh, today, the .NET team is primarily leading the way uh, with the modern Microsoft's move into open source. Uh, you may have seen a lot of news around this uh, around the November timeframe. Uh, and one thing that Microsoft has helped start is the .NET Foundation, which is similar to the Apache Foundation. Its main purpose is to foster open development around the .NET ecosystem. We also help remove operational and legal overhead from developers who just want to open source their projects. And we kind of have established a community for them already. Uh, there's about 35, last time I checked, uh, projects that are part of the .NET Foundation right now. Uh, and about 13 of them are external to Microsoft. So one of these teams as part of the .NET Foundation is Roslyn, which is the code name for the C-sharp and VB compiler project. It started about five years ago. Uh, and when it started, it was to completely re-architect the C-sharp and VB compiler because we wanted to provide an API surface for developers to build code-focused tools. Uh, and so when we were designing this five years ago, we knew we wanted to go fully open source from the beginning because it just made sense. If you want to build smart tools, you should know exactly how the compiler works. Uh, however, five years ago when we were working on this, it didn't make sense to go fully open source at the time. It was going to be more of a piece-by-piece -piece process for us. So how did we eventually do this? Well, a year and a half ago, we made our source code available uh, to the public. So you could read it, you could see it, you couldn't do anything else, but it was our first step. Uh, then we opened up our language design notes, which at the time, a year and a half ago, we were working on C-sharp 6 and VB14. And the community feedback we got on these notes was critical in determining what we kept or cut for C-sharp 6 and VB14. Uh, at this point, we had our feet under, enough, under us enough with open source that we were able to start accepting community pull requests. Uh, so what I mean up here, it says source open. What I mean by that is that we're still doing a lot of work internally. So code reviews will st were still done internally. Bug tracking was still done internally. And we are still doing direct commits to the repo. Uh, and along this journey so far, we ha uh, decided to take a learning in the open approach, is what we like to call it, where the community was helping us make course corrections along the way to help us uh, on our journey. So one thing that the community really steered us towards was moving to where the community already was, which was on GitHub. Uh, so early this year, in January, we moved to GitHub, thanks to Jared Parsons, my colleague who is sitting down here. You should come talk to us later if you have questions. Um, and so we moved to where the community was on GitHub. Uh, once moving to GitHub, 
we were able to completely adopt the community workflow. So we submitted pull requests uh, to make code changes, the same as anyone else would. All of our code reviews were done in the public, and all of our issue and bug tracking is done uh, through GitHub now. And the last thing now is the community is steering us towards improving our documentation. Uh, we, so what we're actually working on right now is how do we do collaboration on docs in the open. So if you have ideas, come find me or Jared, because we would love to talk to you. Because uh, the wiki model isn't really working for us right now. So the biggest change for us was actually this move from open source, or source open with uh, limited contributions to fully open source. So this, this is just like a snapshot of how our community interactions have changed from the, with this model move. So we have now 10 times the number of community accepted PRs per month. We have five times the number of community filed issues per month, and five times the number of forks per month, just by moving to working mostly in the open instead of behind closed doors, uh, which is huge. I mean, this is a huge change in the amount of community interaction we've seen. And now if we wanna like, take a step back uh, and see how we're doing uh, compared uh, like our co-contributor growth over time. So this is comparing us to uh, Joyant's Node.js and Xamarin's Mono project, uh, and it's showing how the .NET Core library, the .NET runtime, uh, the .NET compilers, which is Roslyn, and the Visual F Sharp team are doing with our code growth, our code contributor growth over time. Uh, so you can see that Roslyn, the runtime, and uh, the core libraries are actually, uh, the community is growing a lot around code contributors. Uh, and it's normalized so that time is zero if you're having trouble reading this graph. So this is what Node looked like uh, nine months from their inception. So this is a huge volume of community we're generating and a huge amount of interaction, which leads us to our three tensions of open product development. So how do we do open product development without being randomized by all the community interactions coming in? For example, looking at the first C Sharp 7 design notes of the year shows that we generated almost 250 comments on the thread and over 100 different participants, which is a huge amount of interactions, that, and they're all high quality, so we have to sift through all these, and how do we stay productive with this large volume of incoming feedback? So one thing we do to try to help channel this is we posted a public roadmap uh, and so this like, you know, outlines our goals and the features we're thinking of doing uh, to funnel this interaction. But it really only helps with incoming pull requests and feature requests. It still isn't really helping with language design, which is a problem that we're currently trying to solve. So if any of you all have worked on other open source languages and have ideas, please come talk to me or Jared. We would love to talk to you. We're currently looking at what Rust does. Uh, which is pretty different from what we're doing. So if you have ever contributed to Rust, come find us, tell us how you like it. So the second tension is reconciling salaried contributors and passionate contributors. And what I mean by this is while people internal to Microsoft are probably also passionate about our projects, uh, the root motivation may be different. So the core part of this tension is that Microsoft is a large company and people move around all the time. People get promoted, people move teams, people leave the company. So how do you keep the interaction in a community stable and healthy when there's a part of it that's always moving around? Um, and so from investigating this, we realized that this huge move to open source is just as much as it is about big companies learning how to work with open source as it is about the open source community learning how to work with big companies like us. So one uh, awesome, passionate contributor example is Jeff Norton, also known as Kangaroo. Uh, within four days of the core CLR going open source, he got it completely ported to Mac OS X. He told us he didn't sleep for those four days, which is kind of scary, but also totally awesome. Uh, and this is someone that we want to keep uh, active within the project. But he's already created core relationships with people that are internal to Microsoft. And if they get promoted and move on, how do we keep people like Jeff around and contributing? Uh, the, last, uh, yeah, the last one is uh, how do we adapt distributed teams? So we have people from all over the community contributing to our project and all over the world. Uh, so how, when everyone's working in a different time zone, how are we keeping the energy high around our project? I mean, people are asleep when we're working, we're asleep when they're working, how do we figure this out? Uh, and it seems like a lot of actually open source projects do have this problem, so I would love to hear how you all are doing it. Uh, 
So one thing that the Visual F Sharp team does is they have monthly online meetups over Skype. Uh, and they do these at 9 a.m. Pacific time, which you know, helps everyone in the Americas and like Western Europe and maybe parts of Asia. But then there's like a whole time zones of people that are completely cut out from these online meetups. So how do we keep everyone involved uh, when we all live in different places? So again, these three tensions are, how do we maintain product direction without getting randomized by all the feedback we're getting? How do we reconcile salaried and passionate contributors? So this is just as much about us learning how to work with the community as the community learning how to work with us. And then how do we adapt to distributed teams when everyone's working in a different time zone? So I think so far we've been doing a pretty good job of managing these. We still have a lot of work to do, but so far it's been going pretty well. And I think the thing that we've actually done super well on the .NET team is actually fostering community. So we pretty much followed three principles that have really helped us with you know, getting people involved in our project and keeping things healthy. Uh, and so the first thing is before .NET went open, had the big open source announcement in November, we had a lot of people internally who were already part of the open source community. So they like put together this email that kind of had all of their advice for how you should interact with the open source community and how you should do it. And the premise of it was, don't be a jerk which is pretty obvious, uh, but you know, we all know the internet changes people, so and, you know, sometimes you just need to clarify it. So I've actually also included some snippets from that internal email to satiate your curiosity. Uh, so this is just saying like, you know, everyone deserves respect on day one, you should be a role model, and that you should provide people with actionable feedback. Uh, they're pretty self-explanatory, uh, but it's, it's good to help set the stage for how we wanted to do open source right and that we're committed to doing this. The next thing that we did pretty well was realize that we're all a team. No matter where you live, no matter where you work, no matter who you are, we're all working towards a common goal on the same project and we all want it to succeed. Uh, which also means you have to be responsive. So the Roslyn team, before we moved fully open source, uh, the community actually was telling us that we weren't being responsive enough in the open, which was probably because we were doing a lot of work internally. Uh, and so when we actually moved to fully open source, we measured how well we were doing with being responsive using the OctoKit API. Uh, and so we actually learned that now we respond to 75% of pull requests within the first hour of them being published, and we close almost 80% of pull requests within the first three days of them being published which is pretty incredible, honestly, with how international our community is. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see, as time goes on and the community grows, how well we're able to uh, maintain this interaction. And the last and probably most important thing that we did was have fun. It's super important to have fun. The open source community is you know, full of tons of quirky, fun, awesome people. And you know, believe it or not, Microsoft is also like that. And so we want to share our culture with everyone. So one thing that the Roslyn team did to celebrate people who are our first code contributors was we sent them cups of tea, which is a language joke. And on the back, we engraved their SHA-1 of their first commit and their username. And we mailed it to anyone that was one of those first people to dip their toe into our project. Uh, and people love this. You can see them all on Twitter. If you check out my Twitter handle, I retweet all of them. Uh, and it was just a fun thing we did to uh, really invigorate the culture around and like share what we're like uh, with all the community. Uh, and the point that I want to end on is that we're still learning. Uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, we made this uh, logo up here, the Roslyn one, uh, because what open source project does not have a logo and does not have a sticker? Come on, guys. Uh, so we decided that we needed one. So we sent it out internally to be like, hey, look at this design we came up with. And there was actually a ton of pushback on it, which I found surprising. But then when I took a step back and realized what we're doing, Microsoft is huge. Uh, the thing that seemed to resonate when I was talking to people before is that we have over 100 buildings on main campus filled with people who work at Microsoft. We are huge. And now we're making this huge change to moving to open product development. And it's not just affecting engineers and their workflow. It's affecting everyone at the company, like marketing, HR, management, the legal department. Like this move is touching everyone in the company, and it's a huge culture shift for all of us. And we're trying to do it well. So to celebrate our success to moving towards this, can't turn my head, I've brought 
some awesome stickers that we now have, especially Roslyn ones, uh, to show that we are moving forward and that we're making progress in this open source space and we're super excited. And while we still have a ton to learn, uh, we are thrilled with where we've been going so far and we can't wait to see what comes next. If you have questions, come find me and Jared. We'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Casey. All right.